50 years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers. This time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. Good morning, everybody. I am Chief Meteorologist Brad Penovich here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And if you couldn't be down on the Space Coast for Artemis One launch, this is the second best location. We're going to do some live streaming of the event and kind of host the party here as we get ready for what is a really just a monumental uh, rocket launch. You see behind me on 36B launch pad down at Kennedy Space Center, that is the, uh, the largest, most powerful rocket that NASA has ever built. Um, it's a little bit shorter than the Saturn V, depending on the configuration right now. But if you've been following along this morning, there's been some issues. We're kind of in a hold right now at 40 minutes. They're at L40. They're just locked in right now. So there's clearly going to be a delay. We are not going to launch at 8.33. The launch window goes all the way till 10.33. So we've got a two-hour launch window. And there are some rumors online um, with some space Twitter that maybe this is going to be a scrub because these are pretty significant um, problems. And I, I'm going to, I'm just going to, oh, sorry, I got to turn this down. I got the radio cranked up here as well as I'm listening. So I'm following along with the NASA radio and we're also following along their blog. The trouble they ran into, and this was around 623 this morning, uh, they were basically replenishing the propellants that go into the engines. There's these massive engines at the base of the rocket, which are identical and rebuilt from the space shuttle. Uh, engine number three has had some issues with, they call it conditioning. They basically can't keep it pressure pressurized. And they also noticed a crack in some of the protective foam that's in the central stage as well. So those two issues are still ongoing. And until they correct those, uh, they're not going to launch. So engineers are working heavily on all of those issues right now to try to kind of alleviate the pressure issues in the engine. Obviously, anything with the engines is a big deal. And if we remember from the, the space shuttle age, any kind of cracks in that protective foam can be an issue as well. I think that's a little easier fix than the engine issue. Um, you know, one of the things about the, the, the fuel that goes into these engines, it constantly has to be replenished because it's evaporating off. And so if you can't keep it pressurized, um, that's a big problem. And so the refueling of uh, the fueling process took, you know, this morning they started doing that early on and they noticed these issues. So right now we're in a hold. I do not think we're gonna launch at 8.33 based on what's happening right now. And depending on how bad this problem is and if they can't get it fixed or rectified fairly quickly, we're likely going to see a scrub today. The other issue is the weather. Obviously, the later we get into the morning hours, uh, we start dealing with the sea breeze coming in off the coast. So the more that we see the heating of the day develop, uh, if we see this delay go into, let's say, 9.30, 10 o'clock, we start getting the sea breeze. And if you've been to Florida for vacation, you know right around the middle of the day, we start to see the sea breeze come in and those afternoon storms start to bubble up. And that would definitely be a weather issue for sure. So that's kind of where we are right now. But if you're tuning in, we're still going to talk about Artemis here and get ready for the launch and just hope that it goes off maybe a little bit later. Um, if you're not familiar with what Artis Artemis is, um, this is our mission to not only go to the moon, but eventually go to Mars. It's an amazing mission. And we're going to show you a little story about, you know, what Artemis is all about and kind of give you a 101 to catch you up to speed if you're not familiar with what's going on today. Artemis is the Greek goddess of the moon and twin sister to Apollo. And as the namesake for NASA's new deep space exploration program, it's a nod to where we're going and where we've been. That's one small step for man. And to all of us that gaze up at the moon, 
dreaming of the day humankind returns to the lunar surface, folks, we're here. We are going back. And that journey, our journey, begins with Artemis One. Artemis One, the first flight bringing together the most powerful rocket in the world with a new human space capsule and all the upgraded infrastructure back here on Earth to make it a success. NASA built this mission on a solid foundation of know-how, creating more power, more technology, and more capability to propel us farther from Earth than ever before. There are four objectives with this uncrewed first flight. Priority one is making sure the Orion space capsule returns safely, and it's no small feat. Orion will be coming in faster and hotter than any human-capable spacecraft before, reaching speeds of up to 25,000 miles per hour and temperatures of up to 5,000 degrees. Engineers will closely follow how Orion's heat shield performs. Its re-entry conditions are so extreme, no facility on Earth can recreate them. This will truly be a one-of-a-kind test. Next, retrieving the Orion capsule after splashdown. Nothing will give engineers better information for how Orion performed than the capsule itself. They will also retrieve the parachutes that slowed its descent through the atmosphere. Third, testing out all that new gear. From the launch pad to the rocket system's precision time separation, the capsule's navigation, and of course, the return to Earth, Every facet of hardware and software debuted in this new era of space exploration will be scrutinized. And of course, there's a lot of science packed in, even if people are not. And the experiments on board, from deploying mini satellites to how intense radiation will affect electronics and future astronauts, there's more than just rocket science happening here. On its 43-day journey, Artemis 1 will cover 1.3 million miles, equivalent to more than 50 trips around the world. And this is just the critical first step of several, with eyes set on a lunar outpost and beyond in the next decade. But our eyes are focused, not the immediate future, but out there. It's a future where NASA will land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And on these increasingly complex missions, astronauts will live and work in deep space and will develop the science and technology to send the first humans to Mars. Yeah, every time, you know, we see one of those stories, it just gets you excited for this mission. You know, it's been, almost 50 years since the last mission to the moon. That was Apollo 17, and that would have happened in December of 1972. So, you know, again, a whole generation of Americans, uh, several generations, by the way, that just don't understand or, or weren't around the last time we landed on the moon. The difference with this rocket is we're gonna go farther into space than any human has ever gone. The orbit that they're eventually gonna take around the moon is gonna allow them to go much further out than even any of the Apollo missions did. So this is a really amazing uh, piece of technology. The other thing I'm looking forward to, and as we kind of follow along, we're kind of monitoring the situation as well on what's happening with this delay, um, is the fact that we have so much better technology now. <laughs> I mean, to think about what happened during Apollo, um, error, you basically had a, a computer that was maybe a tenth of the power of your cell phone operating that whole mission. And now we have supercomputers and just the amount of technology that we have at, at our fingertips for this mission makes it you know, a really exciting mission. Uh, this rocket itself, I wish I was there because um, this is gonna be a spectacular launch. For those that remember the space shuttle era, um, those solid rocket boosters, which are the two large rockets that are strapped on the side of the main fuselage, uh, that's solid rocket fuel. If you were a kid and you had model rockets like I did, it's essentially the same kind of material. It's packed hard into there and they burn for exactly two minutes and they're done. But they do about 70% of the work. They get most of that uh, spacecraft and rocket off the ground. And then the main engines, which are in the middle, attached to that central stage, do the rest of the work. And that's the problem we have this morning. It's not the solid rocket uh, motors or boosters on the side. It's really those engines in the middle. And as I'm monitoring the feeds here, you know, as we kind of watch what's happening on, engineers still trying to troubleshoot what's going on with 
engine number three. Haven't heard much about what happened to that crack in the thermal protective system on the flanges of the core stage. Uh, that seemed like less of an issue and something they could fix pretty easily, but it does sound like they're still working on it. Now, just to kind of give you kind of the timeline of this, the launch window opens at 8.33. That's the beginning of the window. Now, ideally, you love the launch at 8.33, but the launch window goes all the way to 10.33. So you got a two hour window um, that you can launch. If you cannot launch in that window, it's gonna be a scrub either way. And the next launch window will open up on Friday, and then there'll be an additional one next week. So those are the three, at least windows they have kind of introduced. If there's three scrubs, they will probably have another one down the road. Um, but you gotta remember, this is a busy spaceport down there at Kennedy Space Center. You've got SpaceX, you've got other rockets going off. So kind of timing this out around all those other launches is part of the issue we have with trying to get this in. And then the timing, the window to get into orbit correctly to get to the moon <coughs> only happens on certain times. So that's why those are critical, those launch windows. And so the delay right now has to do with the center stage and one of the engines um, down at the bottom. So when you look at this rocket, you immediately think of two things. You think of the Apollo missions because it looks like the Apollo rocket. And you also heard me reference those solid rocket boosters on the side. Those are actually reconditioned space shuttle boosters. So this rocket is gonna have a lot of comparisons to the Apollo missions and the space shuttle. And to kind of take a look at the difference between all three, um, we're gonna do a story here about how this rocket got to the launch pad using some of the technology we learned from the Apollo missions, but also a lot from the space shuttle missions. You may notice that some of the components of this Artemis 1 rocket look familiar. The core stage and solid rocket boosters look like those of the space shuttles, and the Orion capsule sure does look like the Apollo capsules that took astronauts to the moon in the 60s and 70s. NASA has taken tried and true designs, upsized them, and outfitted them with the modern technology to make this Artemis mission a reality. But it's a delicate balance between progress and protection. We're building a little bit at a time. Um, and when humans are involved, innovation happens at a pace that still keeps them safe. So that's a, a tough balance. After each one of these missions, we have to innovate. We have to learn. That's why we do a test flight. That's why we do an uncrewed test flight before we put crew on there. Yeah, so, you know, it's kind of interesting to see how we took parts of the Apollo mission and the space shuttle uh, mission and put them together. So just to update you on what's going on, we're kind of stuck right now at L40, which means the countdown clock has been locked at 40 minutes right now. Uh, basically a hold as we kind of wait and see what happens with the engine number three and get it conditioned. I'm also watching the weather uh, pretty closely. And one of the other concerns, obviously, as a meteorologist I have, is the weather criteria out there. You know, you can't have lightning anywhere near the launch pad or along its flight path. You can't have precipitation. You can have a lower visibility, certain cloud levels and wind. Wind is not going to be an issue. This time of year, you tend to have pretty calm winds in all layers of the atmosphere. The issue this morning or later this morning, if we continue to see this hole, is going to be that right there. So the Kennedy Space Center is in the middle of your screen and you can see those showers which have developed off to the south and east. So those showers are drifting north. Now, they're not drifting directly at the launch pad, but they're drifting east of it. And the launch trajectory is going to take Artemis off to the east, almost due east. So it's gonna be going off in that direction. So even though those aren't over the launch pad, that would be where the rocket would be going. So they would not go through those precipitation areas. And also you could see lightning. Now there's no lightning being detected there right now, but the rocket itself can trigger lightning. Now, one of the cool things about the launch pad, um, and guys, if we could pop the launch pad back up, I wanna show you something that's pretty cool. Um, there's three big towers. You see those giant towers surrounding the rocket? That's actually the lightning protection system. Those are essentially giant lightning rods. And uh, yesterday, as strong storms moved through the area, two of those towers took direct hits. I think there were up to five strikes that occurred and they did their job. So that's, those are considered the lightning protection towers and they're um, supposed to take the lightning strike. They did their job yesterday. You gotta think about where this is. This is obviously in Florida. It's a very uh, storm friendly environment down there, especially in late August. Um, and they're out on this cape, which sticks out into the ocean. So the, the tallest objects are all of those buildings, um, the water tower, the rocket launch pad, but those towers end up being the tallest objects and they generally take the charge. Now, 
they will direct that charge down into the ground and away from the rocket because they do not want uh, the launch you know facility the pad or the rocket to be struck directly you can kind of understand why there's numerous electrical devices uh, we've got liquid rocket fuel solid rocket fuel in there um, it would cause you know destruction so it was interesting to see yesterday that those towers actually did their job so today we're going to watch any of these storms that get anywhere near there because lightning is one of those things that we're watching carefully now this morning the air force which does the the weather outlook for Cape Canaveral did give them an 80% chance of favorable weather. The problem is that was at launch time, which is was at 8.33. That is not gonna happen. It's going to be much later than that. So that the chance of seeing storms increases as we get later into the morning hours. I'm just updating the blog here from, from Artemis and seeing if they've had any updates. They have not changed since this morning. And what we have right now is an issue with conditioning that engine number three, the RS-25 engine. Um, which is number three at the bottom of the core stage. They cannot get it to properly condition. Um, and launch controllers said the engine is increasing the pressure in that core, but the tanks are bleeding off some of the, the propellant. And so they can't get it under that proper temperature to start. So that, that is a big issue. Um, and that was this morning at around 623. The fact that this not, has not been updated is not a good sign because that means they're not making progress um, and the issue has not been resolved. There's no, there has not been a scrub yet, I will tell you that. I've been, honestly, Twitter's been probably the best place to monitor this. As we look through Space Twitter, you see my Space Donuts there as well. Um, we don't see any reports from anybody on the ground of there being a delay or a scrub right now. Um, so right now, the good news is uh, it's still on a hold. That's where we are now. We'll watch the blog carefully to see if there's any updates here. I don't see them adding any updates currently. Um, so we'll see it as this goes, but we're going to still kind of wait this out with you at home as we watch this and hopefully we can get this launch off today. If it does not go off today, the next window is going to be Friday. Now, Friday's window, I think, starts at 12.45 p.m., um, which is great. You don't have to get up as early. I won't be drinking as much coffee. The problem is the afternoon thunderstorm activity is more prevalent during the afternoon hours in Florida. So weather could be more of an issue as we get later into the week. We also got a couple of tropical systems out there in the Atlantic, which could develop and maybe cause some issues down the road, maybe as soon as this weekend or early next week. So I think weather will become more of an issue if we do not launch today. So the technical issue is our problem now. Weather could become our issue going into the future. So a lot of folks have heard about the Artemis launch. Why aren't there people on this one? Well, Obviously, this is the test. We want to test every system on there. And while there aren't actual humans on board, there's something else. It's essentially crash test dummies. They have basically what would be pseudo astronauts on board with all kinds of sensors. And one of the interesting sensors, I was talking to Tony Rice last night, he's a NASA ambassador, um, was about these human dummies that they have on board that kind of test um, some of the radiation and other forces that the astronauts eventually will experience. Because remember, this mission is going much deeper into space than any of the Apollo missions. And how that's happening is the orbit that they will have around the moon is a much wider orbit. So that will put them at the farthest reaches that man has ever been. And so we don't really know what kind of radiation they will see out there. So that's why this mission is also important. We're testing all the technical parts, but there's gonna be a human test done as well uh, with those crash test dummies. So let's take a look at those, uh, what, I hate calling them dummies, but we'll call them <laughs> test subjects. These astronauts that are on board, they're not human, but they are gonna give us a lot of information and a lot of research to help us kind of get prepared for when humans are on board Artemis II. Although humans have traveled to space for decades, there are still many unknowns, especially when it comes to new equipment and traveling farther than ever before. With safety top of mind, NASA has a very special crew for its first flight of the Artemis program. Three high-tech mannequins equipped with sensors will monitor conditions future astronauts will encounter. Sitting center is Commander Munikin Campos, whose chair will measure vibration and acceleration forces atop the new Space Launch System. 
and Campos will be wearing the new Orion Crew Survival System suit to be worn by his future human counterparts during those critical moments of launch and return. These custom-sized suits are pressurized, fire retardant, have a built-in waste disposal system, and provide temperature control and radiation protection for up to six days if needed. In deep space, astronauts will face radiation amounts unlike anything we deal with here on Earth. That's where Campos' companions, Helga and Zohar, come in. Known as phantoms, each is packed with more than 5,600 sensors and radiation detectors. Scientists will be looking for more information on radiation loads on skin, muscles, bones, and internal organs, which is why Helga will wear a new protective vest. Once these phantoms return, scientists can compare radiation exposure between the two and improve protection for future space missions. Yeah, I like the mannequin. That's better than dummy. That <laughs> sounds a lot better. But it is really cool. I mean, you know, what, the Apollo mission, we didn't really have the capability to test some of this stuff. So the fact that we could do this with Artemis and basically run this whole mission, I think that's the one thing. The launch is just the beginning of this mission today. This is a 42-day mission. So the launch is going to be spectacular. We're going to see a lot of that. But over the next 42 days, you know, this mission is going to continue. It's going to go do an orbits around the moon several, several times. It's going to just deploy some small satellites and then do a splashdown. So it's basically a, a dress rehearsal for what would be the manned mission um, out to the moon. So this is going to be a huge, huge undertaking over a 42 day period. Now we're still on a hold. We're at L40, which means the countdown has been held at 40 minutes. So we're not launching at 833 for sure. Uh, the launch window does go all the way till 1033. So uh, conceivably we can hold this all the way until we get to that, you know, 1033 time frame. But if we're at, you know, 40 minutes before that and we're still at L40, that would definitely be a scrub because they're not going to take time off of that clock. Um, I was listening during that story um, to the to the control, the, the command control center there, and they're basically saying they're just still efforting. The engineers are still trying to troubleshoot this issue with engine number three. Now, this rocket might look new to a lot of folks out there, and it is. It's got a, a conglomeration of several other parts from the Apollo mission, the space shuttle mission, but it, it is it is a whole new rocket. It's actually called SLS, and that's uh, an acronym that they use for this, this launch system, this space launch system that's going to allow men and women to go deep into space, not just the moon, eventually Mars and maybe beyond. And our meteorologist, Brittany Van Voorhees, dear, did a great story about Boeing and how they helped put this together. And I think the cool thing about this mission as well is that all the different companies in the U.S. that contributed to this rocket, you see the size comparison there. Um, you could see the Saturn V is slightly bigger um, just because uh, of the configuration, but you see that SLS, it's bigger than the Statue of Liberty. It's bigger than the space shuttle, uh, but it's more powerful than any of those. The amount of thrust that they're gonna be able to produce here is gonna be tremendous. And the reason there's so much thrust is this is a, the, the manned crew is actually gonna be pretty light. When eventually we launch cargo, and what I mean by cargo is eventually <clears throat> we're gonna launch the materials to put a lunar base and eventually a lunar space station that will orbit the, the moon, that's going to be heavier. So they need that thrust to get all of that weight off the ground. So eventually you're going to see uh, the top of the rocket get bigger as they put more cargo in there. The Orion capsule is pretty small. It holds four people. But eventually once we put bigger segments on there, this might end up being bigger than the Saturn V rocket. And, and meteorologist Brittany Van Voorhees talked to the folks at Boeing about what it was like to put this rocket together and the pride Boeing they had has built in the doing this. Rocket ever launched, NASA's Space Launch System. The company boasts it is the backbone for a permanent human presence in deep space. Here to discuss what makes this rocket different from anything we've ever seen is Christine Ramos, an engineer with Boeing Space and Launch. Thanks so much for being with us, Christine. Thanks for having me. So what is different about the SLS rocket than anything humanity has seen before? Well, this rocket is pretty powerful. You know, uh, when we designed this rocket, we designed it not only to be man rated, but to be evolvable, to be able to really be customized to all of the future missions for just having a sustainable presence in deep space. So you can change it for cargo, co manifest, um, crew, and that's what makes it so different. And the fact that it's so powerful that we can carry much more than any other rocket is a big game changer. 
What makes this technology both new but also different from maybe things that we've seen like 50 years ago, right, with the Apollo missions? So when you saw it before with Saturn, you did see that block configuration and that's what we have. And that's what's pretty similar. Um, the new that we have, we have a new crew module done with Orion. Um, and we do have a new second stage that's going to change us and allow us to carry a lot more. What did Boeing have to do to accomplish these specific goals to create this rocket? Oh, wow. It, it took a lot of people, a lot of really great, smart people. You know, we designed the core stage, um, really looking back at our previous history, our heritage, and working with a lot of suppliers, I mean, across the nation. I mean, over 45 states, we have 1,100 suppliers that we work with that really have not only heritage knowledge, but a lot of progressive like ideas and concepts that we incorporated into this program. I know a lot of scientists right, are always trying to do this, but what makes this exploration in particular, known the subsequent rocket, more sustainable right, for us? This is more sustainable just because we can carry a lot more. Um, it's customizable. Um, and for us here to, to really kick it off, it's just really powerful, you know. Um, for a lot of other programs, you know, they haven't seen something like this, something this big, this powerful, um, this customizable. So that's what makes it change so much more different than any other the rockets. And the last question I have, and really a out of curiosity, right? So Boeing talking a lot about the future too, right? So how will you guys ensure that the SLS and future you know, technology can make it to these future missions that you want to accomplish, like the gas giants, outer solar system, and interstellar space? We're already looking into that. We are looking way ahead of that. You know, we're always focused on Artemis, but you know, um, with the science to Cato that just came out in April, and then we're looking at the heliosphere that's coming out to Cato, we're already looking at missions that will take us further and beyond. On. Um, if you understand our our fleet of SLS, you'll notice that you know we can customize to bigger and bigger volumes, a better upper stage that will allow us to go further to I don't know Uranus, um, Neptune, the interstellar space. So we already have plans to look into that and to work with our science communities on that. You'll love to hear it. Thank you so much again for taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, just a spectacular rocket. And, you know, it, there's a really cool map. If you ever get a chance, uh, go to the Artemis uh, webpage on NASA. They have this cool map of all the different locations and parts that were sourced. And there's actually, I, I clicked on the Carolinas, and what was interesting is there's a couple locations in Mooresville and in Charlotte. One was Sunbelt Rentals was actually one of the, the locations that contributed to this. So from every part of this mission, you've had some part of the United States, whether it was state, city, um, that has contributed to this. So truly uh, an amazing accomplishment to put this on. Now we're still on hold. I did get an update um, why we were watching that. Um, I just was uh, refreshing the, the blog and this was at 819. So uh, the teams continue to hold while gathering data. So they're holding still at a T40 uh, while engineers continue to assess an issue with conditioning engine, engine three. It's one of the four main engines at the base of the central core there, RS-25 engines. Um, engineers are looking at options to gather as much data as possible. So it sounds like they're still troubleshooting, but that was an update um, at 819. And so we're still in a 40 minute hold. So we're not gonna launch on time. We kind of knew that was gonna happen, but it doesn't sound like they're giving up hope just yet. Um, they're kind of holding on um, potentially that we'll be able to get off the ground. And I'm gonna show you real quickly the, the part we're talking about. So these are all the sections. The part we're talking about is down here. These are the RS-25 engines. So there's four of those down there. And number three is the one that's been causing issues. They, can't not, they cannot get it to pressurize and, temper and get the correct temperature. So what they're doing, it's called conditioning. They're basically putting propellant in there and bleeding some off. And in that process in engine three, the temperature is not in a stable location for launch. They can't get it to a temperature that's favorable for launch. So that's problematic because uh, the boosters do 70% of the work, but a lot of the workload after that, the 30% are going to be done by these engines and the rest of the stages. Now, these do the main work to get it off the ground, but these will be going on as well. So this is that's why it's going to be spectacular. You've got these giant solid boosters, and then you've got these four main engines that are all going to be going off at the same time. So if you were down in Florida, this would be a spectacular launch. And one, one of the questions I've been getting uh, locally here in the Carolinas and other parts of the East Coast is, is this visible for areas on the east coast not really because the trajectory with this launch is basically due east so 
this due east trajectory takes it out over towards Africa. And I'll run the I'll run the simulation here. This is a, a great website that I use. Um, it's actually free for uh, calculating these trajectories. Photographers use this as well. It's called Flight Club. Um, dot io and so we'll run the simulation here and you can see it running um, and i'll show you the trajectory of this launch now typically if, if you live on the east coast and you follow me on, on social media you know i talk a lot about um, these pre-dawn and you know post sunset launches off the east coast that are spectacular um, those are usually up the east coast this one is off to the east so see if we can get the profile to load here as it continues to load sometimes it takes a while we'll do the 3d visual visualization here and so we'll, we'll kind of show you the map. So you can see the trajectory is, is basically that red area off the east coast. So the trajectory is going to be basically towards Africa, not up the east coast towards um, Newfoundland or up towards Greenland, which is typically more visible for folks in the eastern U.S. So this trajectory, while not visible for most of the east coast, if you're in Florida, it's going to be absolutely spectacular because of all of those engines, the plume, will be amazing. If you've ever witnessed a space shuttle launch, I think it's gonna be very similar to that, but maybe about 20% brighter and, and more um, more dynamic because of all these engines. Um, and the space shuttle launches were always, always amazing. So uh, we're still in a hold right now, uh, 40 minute hold that we're waiting for um, for this engine number three issue to be resolved. You know, these engineers, they have redundancy after redundancy they are probably scrambling around like crazy figuring out they're probably making calls to colleagues in other parts of the world hey you know what can we do um, to resolve this the thing these are the engines that were rebuilt from the space shuttle so most of the engineers that probably worked on these are based in the united states so there's a, probably a lot of scrambling going on to like how do we figure this out and, and get these going and this is one of those problems you're probably wondering you know well how does this just pop up the day of the launch well these are things you don't really know until you start fueling the engines and fueling this system. So these are the processes that happen right before launch. And when you do that, you kind of notice these issues. And so that's the problem right now is we kind of wait and see what's happening. So, you know, the mission control for this, you know, is in Houston. You probably heard, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Well, it's interesting when you see these launches from Florida, but mission control is actually all the way over in Texas in Houston and our, our station KHOU there did a story about how mission control works and has run out of Houston for these missions flying out of Florida. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Once the Artemis One solid rocket boosters fire, the launch team hands over the reins to mission control at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Here, the flight control team will be flying Orion. The engineers that are sitting at the console, they're the, they're the people that really have the deep technical knowledge. Every command, every milestone is marked by watchful eyes, but they aren't working alone. Katie Oridi manages the mission evaluation room, or MER. If something goes wrong, or the flight control team has a question about kind of a funny signature that we're seeing in vehicle performance, uh, the MER is the team that goes off and does any supporting analysis or digs back through our history of data to see if we've seen stuff like that before. And then we make recommendations to the flight control team. Uh, here's the about. America was introduced to the mission evaluation room in 1970. During the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission, an oxygen tank ruptured, crippling the spacecraft carrying three astronauts 200,000 miles from Earth. Engineer Arturo Campos and his team in the MER went into action to find a way to reroute the electrical system, giving the astronauts enough power to make it home. Another team worked on air scrubbers so the astronauts had oxygen. Another recalculated the path home. The teams of technical expertise made the difference. In 52 years, that aspect has not changed. The MER team is always anticipating the mission's next moves, ready to jump in at a moment's notice, something they've been practicing. Sitting in the MER manager console, and honestly, any console that's being supported, it's um, really intense. Uh, the simulations, I think, prove that to everyone. Usually, by the end of an eight-hour shift or so, you're ready for a, a break. Yeah, so pretty amazing that they hand off everything over to Houston. Now, we're still monitoring, you know, the feeds down here. The rocket is still on the pad. We're at a hold at 40. I'm watching the weather as well because this was my concern 
if we had any kind of delay was the later we got into this launch window this morning, weather was going to become more of an issue because as you know, if you've lived in Florida, if you've been to Florida, these afternoon sea breezes start kicking up. And right now you can see Cape Canaveral, we've got showers um, near the Cape. So I think even if we were going to launch right now, we might be in a weather delay because we've got these uh, little showers. Now I'm not detecting any cloud to ground lightning currently in those cells. Um, but doesn't mean you, the, the rocket itself can sometimes trigger lightning as it goes through there and they will not launch through precipitation. So if there's any rain <coughs> at all in that flight path, they will not go through that. So I'm looking at the live feed here off to the side. I can actually see a shower off guys. If we could pop that back up, it's pretty, you see, look at that. There's the shower off to the right. So we sh show you the radar. You can see it on the radar, but then you look at the picture, you can actually see the shower beyond um, right there. So that there's the rain shower. So we're looking offshore and yeah, that's, there's a rain shaft there. So that's the shower you saw on the radar. Uh, the rocket's going to go that direction. It's gonna go off the east coast of Florida and towards uh, Africa. So right now they probably would be in a weather delay even if it wasn't for this engine issue, which it, if you're just tuning in, we're gonna go to NASA TV and kind of listen in. I think they are debating or talking about what's happening here. I think they're gonna scrub, yeah. It sounds like that's going to be, it's an official scrub, guys. So, um, as, I, as I was suspected. This is Artemis Launch okay, Control. Here we go. With an update, Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson has called a scrub for today. Again, Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson has called a scrub of the attempt of launch of Artemis 1 and the Space Launch System with the Orion spacecraft. The issue that uh, came up was an engine bleed that uh, couldn't be okay, remedied. So as you just heard, uh, guys, that uh, the they, they've scrubbed. And we kind of we were hearing rumors about this um, for a while. I think two things happen here. One, um, obviously the engine issue, but as we were just discussing the weather, I think once you throw the weather in there, I think the launch command was like, hey, we're not, we haven't figured out the engine thing. And even if we did, we'd probably be in a delay right now for rain as well. So we're basically already, uh, you know, three minutes into the launch window that that likely would have put us outside the window. So I think it's probably a good idea that they scrub today because they can really work and get cracking on this engine issue um, and figure out what's going on. Hopefully um, they can get it, get it, you know, taken care of. Now, where we're going now is that um, this is going to be scrubbed. The next window is going to open up on Friday at 1248 p.m. Um, and that 12.48 p.m. time could be somewhat problematic for weather, even more so than today. We saw showers popping up this morning, but Friday, think about that, that's right before 1 p.m. And you know how heating of the day goes. Um, there's more storms that time of year. So last night I was able to talk with Tony Rice, he's a, a NASA ambassador, and we talked about you know what happens if we, if we see a scrub, um, you know, what's gonna happen you know, with this, mission on on friday if this is the problem then you know this the uh, friday launch could be just as problematic for weather issues even if they get that engine issue kind of figured out so tony was talking about you know some of the things that will happen now with this second launch window coming up on friday yeah. i'm hearing the com control center again here i'm just we're gonna wait a second So, so as I'm as I'm listening with you guys, I'm, it's an official scrub, but it does sound like they're keeping the fuel. Okay, did they not scrub? <laughs> so it sounds it it's kind of conflicting information. It sounds like they scrub, but it does sound like they're going to keep the fuel in there. And maybe this is to help troubleshoot the engine. Um, I only heard about half of the conversation. Um, okay, so it's an official scrub, but it does sound like what they're doing, they're not going to vent off all this fuel. I think they're gonna keep it on to kind of use it as a, as a way to, is the prob, uh, to troubleshoot the problem.
Okay. So yeah, they're gonna. Okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm listening here, guys. And so basically, what they're saying is, it is an official scrub today, but it does sound like they're not gonna basically power everything down and, and drain the fuel. They're gonna leave it in to kind of use it as as a way for the engineers to work on this engine. So they're gonna take advantage of this scrub to basically say, let's say let's you know use what we have in there already and we can troubleshoot this as if we were gonna launch and see if we can't figure it out. So they're not gonna launch today, but they're gonna they're not gonna completely wind everything down so that the engineers can work on this engine. So it'll be interesting to see, and sometimes you see some of that looks like smoke or sometimes vapors. Um, you know, that's super cooled liquid oxygen and hydrogen that is venting off continuously. They have to continuously fuel that um, because it's always evaporating and, and venting off. So that's when you see that, that's uh, what looks like smoke or sometimes or steam is that is that really cold liquid oxygen and hydrogen bleeding off. So they're gonna continue to troubleshoot this. They have officially scrubbed, which means our next window for this launch will be Friday at 12.48 p.m. That is a two hour window as well. I, as I was just talking before um, we listened in there quickly, is that's a problematic time frame for thunderstorms um, because that's the heating of the day. The other concern I have for a Friday launch is that out in the Atlantic, um, we've got some tropical activity. We've got a tropical system in the middle of the Atlantic that's probably got about an 80% chance of development. I'll show you real quickly. This area in red right here in the middle of your screen, um, you could see that could be off the east coast of Florida or the Bahamas, maybe not directly impacting Cape Canaveral, but those tropical systems, um, if they're off the east coast of Florida, that's the recovery zone. If there is an abort of the mission, you've got ships out there, you've got recovery of um, the solid rocket boosters also. So that recovery area has to have good weather as well. Um, so if there's a tropical storm or a hurricane out there, um, that could cause issues. So that would be problematic. And then let's say they scrub again on Friday. The next window is Monday. For sure, one of those tropical systems is going to be off the east coast of Florida, whether it's this one, this one, or maybe something else. Um, so tropical activity could become more of an issue. So I think weather is going to become more of an issue um, with the scrub today. Hopefully Friday we can go. Um, if not, Monday would be the next one. And I don't even think they've even announced the window beyond the Monday. So today's definitely been scrubbed. We'll have to wait and see um, if they're going to announce on Friday. Maybe they'll open another window sometime next week. So they'll always have three kind of available. But uh, again, I talked to Tony Rice. He's a NASA ambassador, lives in the Raleigh area, uh, about what this means scrubbing today and what happens on Friday now that we're in the second launch window. So we may... We have a scrub of the mission. So when's the next launch window um, for this if we don't go off this morning, which it looks like that's not going to happen? Yeah, these things happen. I've, I've seen far more scrubs and I've seen launches, um, but you know we, we, we want to have the best success and, and the weather criteria are important. So the next, one's, uh, next opportunity is going to be on the second Friday. Yeah. Um, and that's unfortunately the window opens at, at 1248. So what do you think about that? Yeah, unfortunately, that's prime time for the sea breeze coming in off the coast. And if you've been to Florida any time in the summer, <laughs> you know, we have afternoon thunderstorms. It's like clockwork, that two, three, four, five o'clock time frame. And lightning is one of those big criteria. We've also got some tropical activity out there as well that we've got to contend with. So um, I'm curious. So what what if a tropical system or a hurricane were to head towards the pad? Um, not so much, you know, on the launch day, but if they were waiting for a window to open, would they have to roll the whole rocket back into the uh, the build, the assembly building? Rollback is always a possibility. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that takes a day. Yeah. Because uh, it's rolling at a top speed of about a mile an hour, so the forecasters are probably watching that activity pretty strongly, uh, especially after a scrub like today, uh, and would probably pull the trigger pretty quickly and get that thing rolling back to the barn um, several days in advance. So it, it might seem a little frustrating that the, yeah. a rollback happened, but it's all out of, it's all out of a pronounced caution. Yeah. So, so let's look at that. I mean, we didn't talk about this earlier, but let's talk about the timeline. Like, so mm -hmm. th this is obviously the huge test, right? We got to test mm -hmm. this pending all this being a successful test launch, right? For Artemis one. So what is the next step after this test mission for Artemis? 
so the immediately after recovery, immediately after the crews are, are recovering that capsule as it splashes down off the coast of San Diego, they're going to be gathering all that data. They're going to be gathering all the information that was pulled together during this mission. It is a test. Ultimately, this is a, a, a full out test of the Artemis program in preparation for making whatever improvements need to be made to put people on board. And that's the next step is the Artemis II mission, which will include a crew. And it'll look very much like this Artemis One mission does. And we could actually see a North Carolinian on that Artemis II mission. She's been selected, Christina Cook, um, a graduate of NC State. She also went to the um, North, Carolina Museum, uh, North Carolina School of Science and Math. And she was... So, among those that were selected several months ago to be a part of this. She could also be one of the first to step back on the moon. She could be the first woman to step on the moon. Yeah, and I think that's amazing. I mean, those people that end up being the first ones, and they're gonna be famous, right? I mean, especially in the age of social media, can you imagine if we had social media back during the Apollo missions? I mean, is as is, is famous as those astronauts are, what is this gonna mean for those astronauts that are able to go and actually go on the moon with Artemis II? Well, every astronaut I've ever talked to, and I've asked some of these kind of questions of, they say it changes you. I mean, simply going into space, it changes you, and they call it the overview effect. Uh, and it, it it sounds simple, but it's really, really impactful to them. Simply looking down on the Earth and seeing it without borders, yeah. seeing the weather patterns moving around, um, it, it makes you look at things a little bit differently. And they all turn into environmentalists afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you all of a sudden realize how insignificant you really are when you get that view. So, you know, if we've got a couple backup windows, right? We've got the next one. And if let's say we get scrubbed again, let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, how many windows are open before they just say, you know what, we're just going to wait this out? Or are they just going to keep waiting and eventually launch this rocket? It, it will eventually get launched. And they've announced those first two windows. Friday, September 2nd, and the other one is Monday, September 5th. You know, that's kind of the near-term ones. Looking at the mission plan um, going farther out, there's launch windows available through December. Okay. So this will this will go off at some point. Uh, the, the biggest challenge in Central Florida is often the weather. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be able to pull it off on Monday. If not, there's other opportunities that are available. Yeah, and I think you mentioned this before, but you know that this is a this is not just a short mission like the Apollo missions. This is a, what forty two days or forty one mm -hmm. days. So uh, we're going to be able to, once it launches. I think that's just the beginning of the fun, right? Every day we're going to get some kind of cool update as the mission goes on. And so once the mission takes off, and you know we're we're in orbit, let's say around the moon, uh, what are some cool things that you're looking forward to as the mission is progressing before their splashdown? I'm hoping that we see some interesting images yeah. uh come from the mission i'm really looking forward the geek in me wants to see that radiation data what does yeah. that look like really far past the moon uh you know even getting out towards um some of those positions where NOAA has space weather satellites uh that are measuring something how different is what artemis is going to measure from some of the things that were uh some of the measurements we're seeing with coronal mass ejections and, and other space weather that's coming from the sun, that's really going to help inform predictions here on Earth. I'm, I'm looking forward to the data, really. Yeah, and I think that'd be cool. So yeah, I just thought about this, but this is a question I have because I'll probably get this question from viewers. But so obviously the tra tra trajectory for us in the Carolinas, we're probably not going to see it. But um, if you have a telescope or you've got a great camera, would you be able to see the capsule at all in orbit around the moon? How hard would that be be able to see once this mission is underway? It's a good question. And uh, it, it's one that is actually really similar to the question about, can we see the hardware that was left on the moon yeah. by the Apollo mission? And, and the answer is no. Um, unfortunately, it's just too small. Um, the Orion capsule is um, five, 10 meters, tall, um, which it, even the Hubble is going to need closer, if we were able to point the Hubble tel uh, Space Telescope at the moon and look for Orion, it's going to only be able to resolve something about 100 meters. 
Yeah. So here on, even if you've got those nice, big, long, expensive camera lenses, yeah, you're not going <laughs> to be able to, to make it out, unfortunately. It just seems like you got that moon. And I think the moon's so vivid in our night sky. I don't think we realize how far away it still actually is, you know, and this mission and will be a, so many great pictures. Oh yeah. I mean, this will be, this mission, I think will be a great kind of a lesson on like how long it takes to get there. And like the process of getting that, this is, that's the one object we all see in the night sky, but this mission is really going to hit home how hard it is to actually get up there. So uh, Tony, I'm um, great. Great to talk to you again. I, you know, hopefully once we get this rocket off the ground, we can do this again. And um, I'm looking forward to the the follow-up missions because this is going to be just yeah, an amazing probably. thing to follow over the next years and decades. And like I tell my kids, I mean, they're, they're really looking forward to maybe eventually being on Mars. That's the, that's the next step, isn't it? But we, we got to figure it all out with, uh, with Artemis first. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for doing this. All right, so uh, yeah, we scrubbed today. Uh, that's the bad news. Uh, we still have issues with the engine number three. Um, the engineers are still working on trying to resolve what's going on there because obviously if we can't figure this out today, we're not gonna launch on Friday. So the next launch window opens up on Friday, September 2nd at 12.48 p.m. It's a two hour window. Um, that would be a 39 day mission. Um, splashing back down on October 11th. Then let's say we scrub on Friday. The next window opens up on Monday, September 5th, uh, launching at 12 or 5:12 p.m. And that would be a 42-day mission, similar to today's launch. So you, you notice how the launch windows will affect how long the mission goes because um, you have to have the perfect launch, you know, um, window to get out, and then the splashdown window has to be there as well. So what's interesting is if we do launch on Friday after today's scrub, the mission will actually be three days shorter than if it would have launched today. So um, kind of interesting um, to see that this could be a shorter mission um, because of what happened today. Now again, weather could be a huge issue um, on Friday as well as Monday because as you just heard, both of those time frames are in the afternoon or evening, um, which means thunderstorms are much more likely in Florida. And the other issue is that we're starting to see tropical systems um, be more of a development out in the Atlantic. So tropical systems, whether it be a tropical storm or hurricane, and again, it doesn't have to directly impact Cape Canaveral. If there is a hurricane off the east coast of Florida, that's the recovery and the abort area for this mission. So you got recovery ships and stuff out there um, that would be problematic. And obviously it would not be ideal to be flying uh, a rocket that close to a hurricane, even if it is off the east coast of Florida. So that's the other thing we'll have to watch. Now, I feel like I jinxed everything because I went to Krispy Kreme this morning and bought Artemis donuts. Um, so now we got a whole dozen of Artemis donuts that people in the, in the newsroom will get to eat right now. Um, probably was that we jinxed it. So um, again, if you're just tuning in, the bad news this morning, we've got a scrub. It's really primarily because of engine number three. Um, at, the ba at the base of the main stage, they could not get it fueled correctly. It, um, it was called conditioning. Basically what it was is they pump um, fuel in there. They also vent it out at the other end and they could not get the pressure corrected and then also could not get the temperature to be stable. So it was not the proper um, setup for launch on engine number three of the four main engines. So that happened. And then as we started seeing a delay happen, we saw showers and thunderstorms developing off the east coast of Florida. In fact, one point we could see a shower in the background of this picture right here. So I think the combination of the uh, technical issues and then the weather starting to become an issue it just looked like today was not going to happen so it's an official scrub um, currently today the engineers have not taken all the fuel out i think what they're doing is since they know it's a scrub now they're actually going to use the fuel in there and keep working on that engine as if they were going to launch today and if they can figure that out then that would be great for friday because honestly you know even though it's a scrub and we're going to end our stream today and you're probably going to uh, turn away these engineers are just getting to work they're going to be working hard over the next couple of days because they want to hit that window on friday because if they don't then it's monday and then i have not seen nasa release any more additional windows i do think on friday they're probably going to have to come up with a third window they always like to have this redundancy so um, when you see one 
um, scrub of the three windows, they're likely going to add another one, probably a, what would technically be a fourth one, at some point late next week to make sure they have some backup plans. But as I mentioned, weather is going to be increasingly become an issue um, over the next couple of days. Um, if we go back to the, the graphic here, I want to show you guys the problem that we had today. Um, great interactive site on NASA to see all the different stages. Well, it's going to scroll down. You can highlight what each stage does. Um, so this is the main, the liquid hydrogen tank in the middle. At the very base, you've got these um, RS-25 engines. Um, there are four of them. They are super powerful. In fact, these are the same engines that were on the space shuttle. Um, they've been re-engineered again. Um, and these provide a lot of the lift, um, as well as the solid rocket uh, boosters. These are actually solid fuel, so it's they packed in. Think of like if you had a model rocket. They burn for exactly two minutes and provide 70% of the lift to get it off the ground. These main engines do a lot of the work during that as well, but also the rest of the way. These engines are, have been the problem. Uh, three of the four have been okay. Um, it was engine number three that they had issues with. They could not get it to condition correctly, and that put them out of hold for the 40 minutes, and then it kept holding and delaying, delaying, and then weather became an issue. And uh, just a short time ago, if, if you weren't watching, the, the flight um, director said it's an official scrub. They just did not feel like they were going to be able to get the problem resolved and then weather was becoming an issue which was going to add to a delay and again the window was going to close at 10:33. they got a launch in that window if not it's a no-go so these launch windows are pretty um, pretty specific and when it starts at, at 8 33 they try to launch right at the beginning of the window that gives them two hours of delays if they can't get in that time in that time frame then it's a scrub so today is an official scrub of artemis one um, we'll have to wait till the end of the week I think of all the folks that are down in Florida <laughs> that traveled down there, some um, estimates 100 to 200,000 people down there to see this launch. Um, either they're going to extend their stay, they're going to come back or head back down there, um, and hopefully we see a launch on Friday. The interesting thing about the Friday launch, it will be in the middle of the day. It won't be early in the morning, and if the launch happens on Monday, that would be in the evening hours or dinner time. So again, thanks for tuning in today. We will uh, have coverage again on Friday. Um, James, you have to tell me about here. I think we believe we're going to start maybe around lunchtime, around noon. Yeah, 12 15 Eastern time. So about 30 minutes before launch window opens, which is at 12 48. So very similar to this morning when we started at 8 a.m. with the launch window starting at 8 33. We'll be about 12 15 Eastern time, and the launch window will open up at around a, a 12 48. So 33 minutes after the start of that. Hopefully, Fingers crossed, we'll get this launch off on Friday. And if I have to, I will buy another dozen of Artemis donuts from Krispy Kreme. And now I get to go eat those and enjoy your morning. Hope you have a great morning, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. And keep your fingers crossed that on Friday, we can get Artemis 1 off the ground as we head back to the moon and beyond with NASA.